Doing well. Good. All right. Well, let's jump right in. Um, you guys see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, so yeah, so trends are pretty much um, pretty similar um, to what they've been the last few weeks, I would say. So we're, if we're looking as we get further into the month, obviously the month over month trend is something um, worth looking at uh, in terms of month to date. Um, but I really like that middle column here that talks about the comparison to last year. So I would say the biggest thing that's jumping out to me and it's, it's pretty much um, uh, across the board is the number of properties that are actually active right now. So we're down 40, almost 40% 40 compared to last year um, at the same time. So just to put this for sale number into perspective, this is a snapshot in time. So it's basically um, the 10th of June, the number of active properties in 2020 compared to the 10th of June in 2019. Um, so 39% is very significant. Obviously, I know for those of you, hopefully all of you on this call are those of you that are working with buyers. Um, I know you're all feeling it. Um, and we're still, um, in terms of the first 10 days of June and the overall market, we're down in new listings by almost 11%. Um, year to date, we're down by almost 12%. Um, that trend is a little bit, um, disappointing slash alarming for me from the perspective that I was very hopeful that our year over year was going to increase at the beginning of June, um, you know, as we kind of came further out of COVID. But based on the fact that the first 10 days of June, there were actually more new listings last year than this year means that we're not really doing anything to catch up you know, from being behind, we're actually getting further behind um, of last year in terms of new listings. And as I'm having conversations, and I'll open up the floor in a minute to you guys, but as I'm having conversations one-on-one -on -one throughout the week, I've been just continuing to hear, I have way more buyers than sellers. How many sellers do you have that aren't, you know, that are on the fence now? Um, I was just talking to somebody this morning and it's like, well, we have three sellers. So I'm going to go kind of at the end here and just go through a couple scenarios and scripts that I think could, you could use um, with sellers to kind of reach out and say, look, here's the reasons why looking at buying or selling and then buying now makes sense. Um, and then we look at solds. So solds are only down like 3% for the first 10 days of June compared to last year, which that gap is shortening. And same with the year to date getting smaller. Um, however, if we continue to have the inventory problem, I don't see how this number doesn't look more like this number um, over time. And then pendings are still up. So again, we clearly don't have a demand issue, at least compared to supply right now. We actually um, have more demand and that's probably largely driven by interest rates. But I think that demand is gonna at some point hit the wall of no supply. So we'll see how long we can um, sustain here. When we look at Dublin, numbers are a little bit, not quite as good as the overall market. Um, definitely in terms of how far we are behind on sales, we're 12% more behind in Dublin schools compared to the market as a whole. And then obviously with new listings, we're almost double um, down, almost 25% compared to last year. And then this is the number that I just can't get over, the number of for sale properties down almost 50% compared to last year. Which again, I know if you're working with a lot of buyers right now, you're like, duh, Troy, I didn't need you to tell me that. Um, and yet, I think these numbers are things that you guys, if I'm not seeing that much posted about it, I'm seeing a lot of people post about how many properties are going into contract and how many properties sold, which is all good news. But I think if you sit down in front of a seller and say, look, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, the number of sold properties year to date is only down 17%. And yet the overall market, there's 50% fewer listings. Like now is a great time to be selling your home. Um, we jump into Hilliard. Very, very similar numbers in terms of available um, properties for sale. The new listing drop is definitely a little bit less there. Um, 
but we're still same same story. When we look at I Marysville, oh, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yep. Why is the current versus say month to date and current versus previous year to date for sale numbers the same? Yeah, that's a great question. The reason is, is because the way that they calculate this number is off of how many active properties there were on the market that date this year compared to last year. So okay. these two numbers are always going to be exactly the same gotcha. um, in this scenario. So when you're looking at the active, um, the active numbers, I mean, this is, this is probably the most appropriate. Okay. It's really this column here because really what this should say is the number for sale on June 11th this year versus June 11th last year. It okay. really coming from the first of the month, it's irrelevant. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, if we jump into Marysville, so Marysville was one of the hottest. Hilliard was pretty hot too during kind of COVID and Corona. Um, but again, I, I'm looking at Marysville as kind of a bellwether for the whole market, um, just because they had done so good during the Corona um, kind of virus, and they had a lot more listings than everybody else. And unfortunately, though, the lack of inventory there is starting to catch up in terms of the number sold and number pended, because there's just not anything to sell. So obviously, in Marysville, there's more properties in contract right now than there were last year at this time. Um, so this sold number will probably get a little bit better in terms of the negative. But ultimately, if we don't, if we stay on this trajectory of just not adding as many listings, um, we're gonna be, gonna be kind of staying on the same trajectory in terms of sold. Marysville though, interestingly enough, compared to all the other places we've looked at, actually listed the same number of properties this year for the first 11 days of June compared to last year. So that's a good sign for the Marysville market. Um, and hopefully, because they were kind of far behind on new listings um, towards the end of last month, um, whereas everybody else had kind of been ahead at the end of last month. So hopefully this is uh, the bellwether and that hopefully Dublin and Hilliard and some of those places um, start to follow in terms of at least getting back to where we were um, last year in terms of new listings. Olin Tangi is still looking at the same. I mean, the pendings are just incredible. So we're going to see the year to date solds definitely start to the, the gap start to shrink in the short term um, based on these numbers. However, um, again, if we don't solve um, the new listing issue, um, we're going to be in trouble. I think one thing that's interesting about Olin Tangi, they were one of the ones I was kind of surprised for how poor they were doing during COVID. Um, they seem to be catching up and kind of moving um, in the right direction a little bit um, ever since school got out. So that's interesting. I'm hopeful that Dublin and Hilliard will be the same, but for some reason, people in Olin Tangi just weren't moving um, nearly as much during COVID as some of the other school districts. Um, all right, so what I wanted to talk to you guys about, I guess let's stop there for a second. And I'd love to hear what you guys are seeing in your own businesses. Like, do all of you that are doing pretty consistent business, are you guys seeing um, still that, you know, you have a lot more buyers than sellers? Are you seeing that trend start to change? What, what are you guys seeing? All right, Stephanie, I'm going to call on you. Okay, I'm just looking at my board. Um, I have a closing, I have one closing a week for the next four weeks. And then I, my pipeline is dry. What about, do, are you showing buyers and you just can't find anything? I have or no buyers. I, I'm heavily listing. So one, two, three, four, seven, eight, Nine of my 14 transactions are listings year to date okay. and two of them I was a dual agent on. So, okay. um, so what about your listing pipeline? It's drying up too. I mean, I've got okay. people that, um, I've got, I've got one appointment today for someone that might want to build with, with Bob Webb. Um, and then I would list their home in Hilliard, but that's, you know, nine to 12 months down the road. 
Um, my spring was insane. By the time my last listing in the pipe closes on July 8th, I will have done as much volume as I did all of 2019. So I'm grateful for that. I just don't know what the rest of the year is going to look like. Yeah. I mean, we're, we have sold out. I have one spec in Jerome Village right now, one Bob Webb spec. We've, I mean, we've, we sold a lot of, of our inventory here in the last couple of months. And I think for those of you that have buyers that are looking for something, new build is going to be your haven if you can find one. Um, because if sellers don't start putting their house on the market, it might be the only option. So if you have buyers that are out there looking that can't find something and you haven't explored the new build option, um, I would run there as soon as possible because eventually the builders are going to run out of inventory too. Um, and so uh, I would run there as fast as possible and talk, um, talk about, you know, what that might look like. So um, anybody, go ahead, Stephanie. One client that wants to move, but they want a house in Dublin with a pool around 400,000. So yeah. good luck. Yeah. I would call that <laughs> a unicorn. Right. Yeah. Um, maybe you can talk to them though about interest rates and what it would cost if they, I mean, I don't know how much they would make on the sale of their home. They, their house is paid off. So that's a bonus. So they don't yeah, have so, a home sale contingency or anything like that. Um, there's just, I mean, there's, there's nothing. I, I pulled, uh, one day this week, I think there were seven available homes in Dublin with a pool and like six of them were like a million plus. So what about though finding a, a 350 or 375 that doesn't have a pool yeah. where they could build one? Yeah. Not even if that, even if that meant they had to take out a small mortgage with interest rates where they're at, it's costing them almost nothing. Right. Um, and that's what I, I, that's what I would be talking about all day with them. Um, obviously it would be ideal if they could find it, but the other thing I've always done when people are looking for something like that is send them everything that sold in Dublin between 350 and 450 last year mm -hmm. and show them how many of those houses had a pool. Yeah. Um, not very many. <laughs> right. Um, who else does anybody else have, um, Tony, uh, talk to me about what you're seeing on the listing side of things. Uh, I know, um, are you, do you have anybody that's on the fence or do you feel like most people are moving forward? I don't have anybody on the fence. I, I did earlier during the, the beginning of the COVID, but other than that, uh, ones I'm talking to, I think are, you know, the buyer demand is so great that it's uh, still a great seller's market. Yeah. So what's that script sound like for you? Um, let's say I'm your, I'm your seller and I'm nervous about, you know, Hey, with COVID and the economy and all this stuff, like, you know, the market was down 2000 points yesterday. Like, what do you see in the market? In short, I mean, you can't get, this isn't a better time to sell. We still got high prices. Uh, we have low inventory. And uh, the problem has been is where they're going to go if they're trying to relocate. That's been the biggest obstacle is they don't know, need some type of uh, window or some glimmer of some hope of a house to find. That's probably the only reservations I, I get. At, at this point. So what's your counter to that? Well, uh, the counter to that is, you know, we're coming into this market now and the people that are sitting on the sideline, I tell them, you know, listen, we're probably going to get more inventory coming up soon. But the key is, is getting there before everybody else and getting your house ready and have it ready to be on the market. Because if it's in that price point, say Lewis Center, Delaware, 300 to 400, it's going to sell quickly. And being able to have their pre-approval, everything set as far as lending, and they can get take advantage of that, uh, a quick close, being ready to close soon. Yeah, other than that, there's, there's not many other options other than one new build. Yeah, I think a couple things that 
that I wanted to talk to you guys about today that I think can be really good ammunition. And I'm going to encourage you guys. I'm going to have Talisha send these slides out. And I'm going to encourage you not to just not internalize this, but go create a Facebook and Instagram post out of these things and start educating the general public. You just don't see how many agents doing it. But really letting people know two, two main things. Um, and both of them are centered around uncertainty. Um, I'm not a pessimist by nature at all. However, I think there are a lot of things right now in our economy that um, lead to uncertainty. I mean, if you just look at the volatility of the stock market, you know, I think last Friday on this call, we were talking about the market being up 2000 and then yesterday it was down 2000. Um, there's just even people that study economy every single day don't know what's going on. And so if, if any of you guys were in the market in 2008 to 2011, the number one script that you use in this type of environment is Mr. and Mrs. Seller or even Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. I have no idea. And neither do people with Harvard business degrees know what the economy is gonna be like in November or what it's gonna be like next April or what it's gonna be like next November. But what we do know is what the economy is like right now. And what we know are two main pieces of information. Number one, never in the history of interest rates since 1971 have rates ever been as low as they are today. And this is true today. Um, and number two, I've been in the real estate before gone back and looked at the numbers, but absolutely since 2004, there's never been a time where I've signed into the MLS and the number of active properties was below 3,000. 3, and today it is. And what that means is just like what Tony said, I don't really know what the buyer demand is. I'm not 100% convinced that if we had the same inventory as we had last year, that we would still be in a super strong seller's market because we don't know how many buyers there are between what's selling and, and how many buyers there actually are because there's just truly no inventory. And so what we know is that supply and demand causes price increases. And so even though there might not be the demand to Tony, your point, that there was last year because there's so much less inventory Prices are rising in spite of what's a little bit slower economy. And so I would focus very much on what we know today, and that is no inventory and just ridiculously low interest rates. So this, this graph on here is the history of interest rates all the way back to 1971. But then this next graph is in the last five years, um, what it looked like. So this is what I would point to them to describe uncertainty. And on my next slide, I'm going to show you some specific numbers. But I mean, you, you really don't know how many of these years where interest rates went up or went down were economists predicting the opposite after those of you that pay attention. And if you don't know the answer, it's every year. I feel like they've been wrong the last five years um, in terms of their what they thought was going to happen versus what happened. And so being able to lock interest rates in at 3% or less for a 30-year fix, 2.5% on a 15-year, is just ridiculous. Um, and the reality is the cost of servicing mortgage is anywhere in from 2 to 2.5%. Two and, and the reason why you care about that is because on a 30-year note, the reason you care about that is because that means once rates go down to about two and a half percent, the lenders literally make no money because they have to pay the servicer. The servicer is the person that you write your check to or you go online to pay. Those people, you go on Chase.com, Chase.com, Chase is not oftentimes actually holding a note. There's an investor group what we call secondary market that actually owns the note on the house. Chase is just what we call a servicer. They charge the investors anywhere from two to two and a half percent to service that loan every year. 
So that's three only making like a half a percent on a mortgage. So, so if you're like, well, the economy starts doing really bad, then the rates will go down even more. Like how many buyers have you had that think rates are at zero or that they're going to go to zero? It's never going to happen. And so it's our job to educate people that it's literally never going to get better than this. And so if you can get your house on the market, in a low inventory environment, have an opportunity to do suitable housing contingency. If they're not willing to put it on, you let them get sign a listing agreement and put it in our coming soon um, spreadsheet and let's sell some houses amongst each other. I just think there's a huge opportunity there. So those are the biggest things. And hey, then Troy, this is going to be. Troy, yeah. you're breaking up really bad. Really? Yeah. Yeah, pretty All right, bad. Hold on. Sorry, guys. Sound like a robot. What about now? Better, just low. Huh. That's good. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Did I, how long were you guys? waiting just a minute or two it's just if you were talking about secondary market oh shoot okay yeah. <laughs> um all right so the secondary market uh owns the mortgage or owns the note and then the servicer services it so that's they collect the payments they're the people that have the customer service and they charge anywhere from two to two and a half percent of the annual interest rate so that only leaves about half a percent to a full percent at a 3% interest rate for the investor to make. So because of that, interest rates are never gonna go much lower than they are right now. And the risk of them going up is substantially higher. Um, so basically what you're needing to tell them is with inventory as low as it is and the ability to do a suitable housing contingency or something like that, and be able to still find the house, but have your house already in contract and have the certainty of that, it's gonna put you in a better position to buy anyways. Um, and at the very least, my encouragement is get them to sign a listing agreement, get their house ready, get the photos taken and put it on our office exclusive list and let's sell some houses in between each other. Um, because I just think there's a huge opportunity. We have so many buyers in this office right now. And if you guys each have two or three listings that aren't going on the market because they can't find something, imagine if we had a list of 50 people that were not on the market, but that were interested in selling their house. How many of those could we pair up with each other and, and make deals? Um, so, so talk to your sellers about the opportunity to, to not have the hassles of 50 showings by going on the regular market. But if everything were to work out perfectly, we might be able to thread the needle. Um, and remember, they just because they have a listing agreement doesn't mean that they absolutely have to sell if it doesn't work out. But this is the talking point that I want you guys to really internalize. And I hope that after today, you guys are all able to recite this to every client that you talk to and just it's a really easy math equation to remember because the math is the numbers work so an interest rate of three percent on a three hundred thousand dollar mortgage is twelve hundred and sixty five dollars a month that's no taxes or insurance which obviously varies on a three hundred thousand dollar mortgage at four percent the monthly payment is fourteen hundred and thirty two dollars per month which is a difference of $167 per month and $2,000 a year. Does anybody have, well, you guys can all multiply, but over 30 years, that's over $60,000 in savings on an interest rate. And I think we all love, and I think from a sales perspective, it's great to talk about monthly payments and you know, there's sales classes that say sell the monthly payment, but this is an instance where I think the bigger the number, the more people listen. And if you tell people, if you ask a question like this, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, do you think 4% is a great rate? 
most people are going to say yes. And the reason is because if you remember back to that other slide, rates have been as high as 18%. And say, I think it's a great rate too, but guess what? Today it's at 3%. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, do you know how much you're going to spend over a 30-year period if rates were to go up to 4% instead of 3%? Most of them are going to have no idea. And when you tell them it's $60,000, I think it's going to cause people to think twice about waiting until next year. Um, so I would do like an Instagram post, a Facebook post, and scream this from the mountaintops because I think it's you know, is waiting a year worth 60,000 to you? You know, is it, is it really that big of a deal to pay, you know, cause some people might say this, um, some people might say, well, what if the economy slows down and prices go down by 5%? So if you're on a $400,000 house and prices decrease by 5%, that's 20 grand. You're still 40 grand ahead if interest rates were to go up to 4%. And I just, I think most buyers and sellers don't, don't dig deep enough. Your engineers, stockbrokers, yeah, they probably realize it, but it's still not bad. Never assume that people understand this stuff or have sat down to do the math. So, all right, now my soapbox is over. What else do you guys have? Any questions or any other comments? Um, I did notice over 200 new listings today in MLS, which was encouraging. Um, I have a guy in Muirfield who wants to wait and sell like September, October when he moves back to Florida. It's a great house on the golf course and I'm trying to think of some way to motiv motivate him. And maybe the office exclusive would work. So, no, and let me ask you a question. Mr. Uh -huh. Color, I know you want to be back to Florida by October. If I were able to get you a buyer who is willing to close by the end of July and let you live there until October mm -hmm. when you something that you'd be interested in. I think that's a, a that's a great script and I'm going to I'm going I will actually call him today. Um, just FYI, I also have a really nice um, house coming up inside of reserve. It's a Dominion, you know, four bedroom, two and a half bath, two story, two car garage. Um, actually, way behind it is the golf course. So I, I wish it could be in Dublin and Stephanie could sell it and put a pool in it. Because <laughs> it has a great backyard. So anyway. Yeah, let's, let's get anybody that has properties like uh -huh. that. And if he's not willing to put it on the regular market, at least do the office exclusive yeah. and just put in there in the terms that he needs to have possession mm -hmm. through, you know, through the end of September or beginning of October. And let's, you know, see what we can do. Just remember on the possession after closing that most conventional, actually it's a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac guideline. They're going to want the buyer of an owner occupied property to move in within 60 days of closing. So you need to push the closing date out uh -huh. far enough so that any kind of rent back would be within that 60 day time frame. That's a great idea. I'm going to call him. Thanks. This is yeah. good. <clears throat> Anybody else? All right. Well, we're going to send these slides out. I'm going to, my plus one, I hope I'm going to be able to do this, but I'm actually going to try to get Angela or Talisha to make a couple Instagram um, and Facebook Ooh. posts out of this stuff and include that in the email. So that's my goal. But at the very least, I'll send the slides out to you here good. shortly. Sound good? Sounds great. Thanks, Troy. All right, guys. Everybody have a great day. A great Bye, weekend. everybody. And go get some listings. All right. See ya. <laughs>